The Insanity of God is the name of a book written by a gentleman by the name of Nick Ripkin, who served for six years in Somalia, he and his wife, with the Southern Baptist International Mission Board. Uh, during that time, they, they experienced tremendous, as they call it in the trailer, darkness. Uh, they saw the death, the execution of four of their close friends. Uh, they lost their son. Uh, when they returned uh, to the U.S. after that six years, certainly a certain amount of questioning and wrestling. And uh, the response of that was that he set out on a journey to see what is the norm for the church in the world. And that is the suffering of the church. And the insanity of God is a book that looks at what do we learn from the suffering church. It's, uh, this, this, I know the information is in the bulletin. It's actually being shown in at least three theaters that I'm aware of, uh, AMC Springdale, uh, the AMC Milford, and the Regal in Deerfield. Uh, it's a one night showing. Uh, you can go online and secure your tickets uh, to go. And, uh, and as you saw, the last slide was following the film. Uh, there is a short presentation message by David Platt. Many of you are familiar with David Platt, who wrote the book Radical, uh, who is now the president of the International Mission Board. So just more information. And, and again, providential because we're in Matthew chapter 5. So take your Bible and go there. Um, this summer, we, we have taken the time to look at the Beatitudes and try to understand them in a way that contextually makes sense not only contextually in the text of the scripture, but contextually in the world, in the, to the audience whom Jesus was speaking. Because too often, we, we take some of the words of the Bible and rip them out of their historical and cultural context and just look at them as if the Bible was, was written in the 21st century. Now, certainly it has application. It has meaning to us in the 21st century. But unless we understand it, a lot of time the applications that we make are not the correct applications. And that's why we spent some time uh, looking at the Beatitudes. So I, I want to come back and I want to read this text again as we come to what I believe is the last of the Beatitudes. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and began to teach them. And when you get to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, what is called the Sermon on the Mount, you see this amazing statement that the people were absolutely astounded and amazed because Jesus had taught them as one who has authority, not like the scribes and the Pharisees. So he opens his mouth and he begins to teach. And this is what he opens this sermon by saying. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. This morning, verse 10, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, 
For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You're the salt of the earth. If the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You're the light of the world. A city set in a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Let's pray together. Lord, as we come to these very familiar words of Jesus, and particularly this last Lord, I pray that we would have open hearts, that we might hear what the Spirit says. Um, and that, Lord, you would break our hearts for those who are indeed being persecuted for righteousness' sake. So, Lord, teach us this morning in multiple ways. For Christ's name, say, amen. Verse 10 is, I believe, the last of eight Beatitudes. Now, some will say, actually, there are nine, but eight and nine are combined. They'll look at verse 10, blessed are those who have been persecuted. Verse 11, blessed are you. And so they say verse 11 is a Beatitude as well. I'm not sure that's the case. Two reasons. Number one, if you look at the first beatitude, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 10, blessed are those who have been persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There's the bookends. The first one, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The last one, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Secondly, Beatitudes, uh, these eight Beatitudes, are, are rather general. Uh, blessed is the one, blessed is the one, uh, blessed are those. When you get to verse 11, there's a change. He now apparently turns his attention directly to the disciples and to the crowd who are there, and he says, blessed are you. And so I, I think beginning in verse 11 through verse 16 is, is really then an application, a direct application to the crowd, to the disciples who were there listening to Jesus. And I tell you, what, I can speculate as to why I think he took this occasion to turn it and begin to direct it to them. Remember, we set this in the context of the message of the kingdom. That Jesus came preaching and teaching the kingdom of God. And what he began to teach and to preach, just as he followed after John the Baptist, who said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus comes preaching and teaching the kingdom. And what we've said is because Jesus is saying the kingdom is being inaugurated because the king, him, is here. And so there's an already not yet aspect to the idea of the kingdom. We've talked about that. But Jesus is offering and presenting the fulfillment of messianic hope for the king, Messiah, and for the kingdom, which he would bring in, usher in, in fulfillment of all those Old Testament passages. When, when you go through the first seven, they make sense to the hearers. The poor in spirit we've talked about, and, and, and the mourners and the gentle have talked about the necess necessity of repentance and a poor spirit and those who thirst after righteousness. And those are the, certainly the qualities of those who will inherit the kingdom. But this last one doesn't make sense. It's paradoxical to the idea of a kingdom. Blessed are those who are persecuted. If you are a disciple sitting there 
and you have embraced by faith Jesus as the Messiah, that he's the king, and that he's bringing the kingdom. And if you're Jewish, you've been the downtrodden. You've been the oppressed. Now it's time for the tables to turn, right? If Jesus is the king, the way the Old Testament describes the Messiah who's going to rule and put down his enemies and, and have total victory, and I'm a follower of Jesus, I'm on the winning side. When was the last time winners got persecuted? You see, winners are those who are in control. Winners are the ones who get to set the rules, right? If we're faithful as citizens of the kingdom doing these other things, then why on earth are we going to be the persecuted ones? Because we're going to be the ones with Jesus, the Messiah, who's going to bring in this kingdom, and we're going to rule over those who've oppressed us. And Jesus looks at them, and he says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For the kingdom's all about righteousness, right? And I think that's why Jesus then responds to them. Because I don't think they expect it. I don't think they were expecting to be persecuted. Winners don't get persecuted. And then Jesus looks at them and says, Blessed are you. I think this was a shock to their system. To those who were following and expecting the kingdom to be ushered in, this was a shock to their system that Jesus was saying, no, it's not victory in that you get to be in control. Now comes the time where you're persecuted for my name's sake. When people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. As I reflected on this, the idea of the persecuted ones and the subject of persecution, I I had to come to grips with something called the reality. And then there's some reasons, and then how do we respond? Let, let me just tell you. Okay. Oftentimes, you know, when, when you go overseas a lots of times from out of the U.S., and you travel in other places, one of the things that you, you know, the, the, people go through a tourist phrase that everything is like, oh, this is nice and interesting, but whatever. But if, it, if they're going there and gonna be there for a longer period of time, at some point, they move out of that tourist phase when the reality starts to settle in that, wait a minute, I'm not, going back home two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. I'm here for three, four, five, six months. Maybe longer. And then those things that were quaint and interesting and you, know, you forget about those things and the things that are irritating or different rise to the surface. I remember uh, when Todd, uh, I'll pick on Todd and, and Shauna Geis, when they went to Bulgaria and others have gone to Bulgaria, for example. But, you know, 
to pay your electric bill, right? I mean, you can put it in the mail, put it, write a check, put it in the mail, and mail it in. Uh, not in Vidin. You have to go stand in line. What do you mean I've got to stand in line? You have to stand in line. And so all of a sudden, what becomes apparent is that what we take for granted as norms, that which is normal in American life, in our daily life, isn't normal in many places in this world. I think you'd understand that, right? What we accept as normal. Well, what's wrong with them? This is normal. They're at... No. When you travel a lot and you see a variety of things, you know what conclusion you come to? That life in America is not normal. It is abnormal. It is not the norm. It is abnormal. Being a believer, calling upon the name of Christ, the way we do in this culture and in this society, and the way this society responds to that for the most part, is not the norm. It's abnormal. Pew Research Center estimates that 75%, some have said 80%, of the world's population lives in an area with severe religious restrictions. The majority of those are Christians. 75 to 80 percent of the world. Churches and Christians in more than 60 countries that are identified very clearly, it's beyond that, but 60 countries. That's a third to a quarter, closer to the third. In those countries, the severity of religious or persecution against Christians. Each month, each month, and again, statistics. Uh, gathered in a variety of ways. 322 Christians are killed for their faith. 214 churches or properties are either burned or destroyed or confiscated. And somewhere over 770 other forms of violence are committed against Christians. Now that's, I use the term, the reality. For us, and I'm pointing the finger backwards too, okay? Most of the occasions when we talk about suffering as a believer, in our context, what we're talking about is some kind of physical illness, ailment, um, or, um, relational or that's usually the context some emotional hurt when you come to the words of Jesus and Jesus talks about suffering he's talking about those who suffer not because of the curse of sin and what sin does to people in physical ways and illnesses or really, but directly because of his namesake. 
I think that was a shock to the system of the, of the disciples. And I hope it's a shock to your system and my system. To realize that what we assume is true for the Christian life of comfort and blessing and how often blessing is defined in the Beatitudes by others. So that's not what Jesus said is the norm. You know, the Apostle Paul, on two occasions, at least two occasions, one in the book of Acts, in directing his conversation to believers, said this, through many tribulations, through many sufferings, we must enter the kingdom of God. And then as he wrote to Timothy in, in 2 Timothy, remember this is the last letter that we have by Paul. He's, he's writing from a prison in Rome expecting his own execution. And he says this, that all who desire to live godly will suffer persecution. Now, I could take those words and be very judgmental and harsh and say, well, I guess the reason the church in America doesn't suffer is because we don't desire to live godly. That's not what Paul was saying. What Paul is saying is that the norm in pursuing the righteousness of God is persecution. And you have to ask yourself, well, well, why? If we're the victors, then why? Let me give you some very, they're all related, but let me give you um, a couple of reasons. One, number one, that I often forget. In that the struggle is a cosmic struggle. Uh, that there is a, a battle. There is a spiritual war that's ongoing. You know, when Paul wrote to, Ephes to the Ephesian church and probably others in that region, in, in what's Ephesians chapter 6, he said, we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but against powers and spiritual entities and, and organized spiritual structures, opposition. And what Paul may have even had in mind was that, that wrestling against flesh and blood would have been even political powers. Those who are in the authority, those who are in control, that, that really operating behind them are spiritual entities. And sometimes I forget that, that we're in a cosmic struggle. Uh, now, we would come to the scriptures and we say, well, we know how this ends because we got the book of Revelation, we got the Bible, it tells us, you know. So we would say, well, the war has been won because of the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. The war has been won. And that's true. But even though the war has been won, hostilities, tremendous hostilities continue. Related to that, Jesus told his disciples the night before he was crucified, he said, I, I just want to remind you of something. If the world hated me, expect them to hate you. The servant isn't above his master. If the world hates Jesus, then they hate those who take his name. And with that, 
the words of Jesus in John chapter 3. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. They hate righteousness. It's an expression of the depravity of the human heart. Righteousness convicts. When Christ came into the world, the, the, the Jews saw what real righteousness was like. And even those who were perceived righteous, the Pharisees, hated him. That, that, that takes verse 13 or 14 then a little bit differently than sometimes I've used it and others may use it in how we might first apply it. Understand that the salt and the light of the world means that you are the expressions of righteousness. You are the expressions of righteousness. Therefore, if you are light and if you are salt, expect to be persecuted. You say, well, wait a minute, it says to glorify your Father who is in heaven. Isn't that a good thing? Um, do a study sometimes on what, how you glorify God. And when you, if you do a study on how to glorify God, one of the things you'll come to discover is that you often glorify God through your suffering. So maybe they'll glorify God by carrying out a paradoxical expression of the will of God in his providence. Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3. Matthew, when he's preaching through 1 Peter, is eventually going to get to this text. And 1 Peter is about suffering. Verse 15, Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that's in you with gentleness and reverence. Look, that does not mean you've got to be able to answer every question that somebody asks, and that's not you are, have to be a tremendous apologist. All you have to do is the reason for the hope that is within you in the midst of your suffering. Keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior, see, that's what Jesus talked about in here in Matthew chapter 5. Those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. It is better, if God should will it, that you suffer. It's better for you that you would suffer for doing what is right than for doing what is wrong. That's true. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. What does he mean by that? Now, certainly, we, we, we look at that as imputation and the substitution. But in this context, what he's saying, it was better for in the will of God for Christ to suffer, the just one, to suffer unjustly. In the paradoxical way in which God works, that the righteous one, the just one, the holy one, that this Jesus, it was God's will better for him to suffer for his righteousness. God, do you understand the title of Nick Ripkin's book? Do you understand the title of his movie? The Insanity of God? 
cosmic struggle, the hate of Jesus and the righteous. There's this sense of the providence of God, therefore he's glorified. You know, in the life of the early church, and I think it probably carries over, uh, church historians will take the Roman persecution of the church, beginning with Nero and extending it all the way through to Diocletian. So somewhere around, let's say, ballpark 60 uh, AD to 305, somewhere in there AD. 10 persecutions, a series of at least 10. The, the, the intensity, the degree varied. Uh, some were far more extensive in local areas, but at least 10. As historians have looked at that and tried to understand why, why did the Romans persecute the church so violently at times? And, and what they point to are, are, are th at least three things. And I think they probably flesh out in, in, into more general, but number one is they called them idolaters. They were idolaters because they didn't worship the gods of Rome. They didn't acknowledge the gods of Rome and neither would they pledge allegiance to the Caesar. And so they were seditious idolaters. They were accused of immorality because they often met in isolated places uh, or, or at night. And so because of that, the suspicion was that they were immoral. Some went even further and charged them with cannibalism because when they observed the Lord's table, Jesus had said, this is my body, this is my blood. So they thought that was literal, and so what they were doing was being cannibals. Essentially, they were antisocial. <laughs> they didn't fit the parameters, the accepted parameters of the society. And they were radical. We call it radicalized. That, that meant they were a threat, a perceived threat to Rome and to the stability and ongoing uh, function of society. Does that sound familiar? Understand that why we've been living as Christians is not the norm. It's the abnormal. And as a society moves Christianity because of righteousness, because of the standards, because of the sake of the name, because they will be marginalized more and more. Be charged with being antisocial, a perceived threat to the stability of society. I got an email a couple of weeks ago from Dr. Joy George. There's a student who I, we got to know a number of years ago who now is a missionary with ACA who is in Nepal. And he wrote to Dr. Joy and he said, pray for us because the government is starting to crack down 
on our places to meet, making it difficult for people to operate orphanages, making it difficult for us. And since even that note, it has ramped up even further. Because the government of Nepal perceives them as a threat. Dr. Joy, if you stay in touch with things from ACA, you know that things are changing in India. That the current political leaders of India tend to speak out of two sides of their mouth. They tend to speak out of one side to the West for economic benefit, but in order to satisfy some of the radical Hindu nationalists, they carry out other things in India because Christianity is perceived as a threat to Indian culture. And so it's difficult now, far more difficult now in India, in certain places. That's the reality, and that's the reasons. Well, how do we respond? How do we respond? Well, verse 12, I want to tell you, this one isn't my response. Look at it. Rejoice and be glad. I'm not happy. If things were to change here so dramatically, none of us would be happy. And yet we're called to rejoice and be glad. For the reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets. I want to come back to that. Turn over to, a little further into chapter 5. Because I said Jesus elaborates on these Beatitudes throughout his sermon. So we ought not be surprised that we see this in, in chapter 5, verse 43. You've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Why? so that you may be sons of your Father who's in heaven. That's what Mark talked about, sons of God, that we reflect what God is like because God causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Even the tax collectors do that. If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Therefore, be perfect, mature, expressing what real righteousness is like, even as your father does. Love your enemies. Pray for your enemies. Because that reflects the character and the nature of God. How does God deal in this world? It sends rain on the just and the unjust. There's common grace. They don't deserve it, but he extends grace. And then we certainly pray for those who are persecuted. Chapter 10 of the book of Hebrews, this, this is where for me personally, this, this is where it got challenging. Because I don't know how I would respond. I, I, I can sing about faith. You know, I, I, I love these songs that we sang. Uh, Be still my soul, the Lord is on your side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Uh, a fortress strong against my foes. I will not be shaken, though lips may bless and hearts may curse and lies like arrows pierce me. I'll fix my heart on righteousness. Oh, yeah, I can do that. 
When through the deep waters he calls me to go, the rivers of grief won't overflow. He'll be with me in trouble to bless and sanctify to me. And through fiery trials, I'll know the sufficiency of his grace. I can do that, right? I'm not sure. I confess, I'm not sure. You know, there, there are certainly multiple stories of martyrs and, and people who have suffered, both ancient and, and modern. One that caught my eye was named Sebastian, who during the persecution under Diocletian was arrested and taken out to be executed by firing squad back then arrows and the archers let go and he fell collapsed they all thought he was dead some of the women came to care for the body and found out that he was still breathing and so they took him and they nursed him and they cared for him and renewed his strength so what did Sebastian do? The next time he had opportunity to confront Diocletian, because he had been in a noble's role, Sebastian had, he did. And believe me, it's Diocle it's the story is that Diocletian was astounded to see this man standing before him. You'd think the last thing he would do is make himself visible to Diocletian. So Diocletian says, arrest him again, and this time torture him until you're sure that he's dead, and then throw his body in the sewer. And that's what they did. The women came along again, saw that he had died, took his body, and he's actually buried in the catacombs. I don't know if I would have gone back and confronted Diocletian. What kind of man does that? What kind of courage does it take to do that? What kind of faith does it take to do that? So the crisis of faith for me is, do I really believe what I say? Do I really believe this? Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 32, remember the former days when after being enlightened you endured a great conflict of suffering, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. You showed sympathy to the prisoners, and you accepted joyfully the seizure of your property. How could they do that? Knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then chapter 11, all those great heroes of the faith, and wow. And then you get to verse 32, and what more shall I say, for time will fail me if I tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, of David, Samuel, and the prophets. Remember Jesus said, just like they did to the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions like Daniel, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put armies to flight, women received back their dead by resurrection, others were tortured, not accepting their release, so that they might obtain a better resurrection, others experienced mockings and scourgings, chains and imprisonment like Jeremiah, who then they took down to Egypt, and they killed him in Egypt. Stoned, sawn in two. Tradition says Isaiah was sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was unworthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes. And all these, having gained approval through their faith, didn't receive what was promised because God had provided something better they didn't see what they hoped for. They're still waiting. And I look at that and say, blessed are those who are persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of God, because the response to persecution is 
a growing, strengthening faith. And I have to ask myself, where's mine? Now look, I'm not, I don't have a martyr complex. Uh, and we live in an age of victimization. I don't want to be a victim. But I'm too, I'm too comfortable to let my faith really be challenged and tested. Do, do I really believe the promises? Do I really believe that there's a kingdom? Do I really believe that Christ is worth it? Do I really believe that Christ is sufficient for everything? Do I really believe that? Because the response, James says, knowing, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and perseverance.